أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو لكتتم من لساني يفقه قولي وعما بعد The purpose of uh, these uh, meetings uh, is to uh, among many other things perhaps is to expand uh, or to increase uh, our knowledge of um, these uh, in, in this case in this particular series on Ulul al-Azim or the uh, most well-known uh, messenger message giving prophets peace be upon them all is to increase the knowledge of people uh, concerning these figures all of these figures are well known both uh, in the East and in the West uh, on, but usually on a very superficial level or worse in many cases on a cartoon level uh, for instance when we dealt with the story of Nuh salam, the most of the images that you find regarding Sidna Nuh salam, are kind of Walt Disney like pictures of this uh, guy with a long white beard and a He's got a you know a, a bird that's flying off of his hand, or these all these animals you know in pairs sticking their heads out of uh, the side of the ark, this cartoonish ark, and so on and so forth. You know, a very deep knowledge that you know of what he was about and what his mission was and what he was doing and the many years that he put into the mission and so on and so forth like that. And not only that. The fact that uh, basically you know, a good percentage of the uh, you know the Earth's population was uh, uh, drowned, but that's all kind of covered up with this uh, massillage of uh, makeup of uh, pink and uh, elephants and uh, giraffes and uh, you know teddy bears and rainbows and sentimentality. And uh, again, you know, uh, with the uh, with the Sidna Ibrahim, uh, uh, salam Abraham, you know, the people. The, the, there was somebody who did a poll in America. They went around asking, "Well, who was Abraham?" And most people talked about Abraham Lincoln. They had very little understanding about who was. Uh, oh, yeah, there was this prophet Abraham. They knew about so and so and so forth. And you know, routine, routinely we're told that this is a uh, Judeo-Christian nation. Well, you know, of course, in reality, it's not a Judeo-Christian nation at all. It's a Greco-Roman nation, which is obvious to anybody who goes to Washington and looks at the architecture and so on and so forth, and the ideals and so on and so forth. Uh, it's uh, the thought behind it is not anything to do with really the teachings of the. Prophets of Beni Israel, or the teachings of uh, Sidna Isa, uh, Prophet Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, but really of uh, the continuity of Greco-Roman thought, Mediterranean paganism, if you like, uh, paganism in the sense that uh, you know the belief in in the unicity and the oneness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is um, not in the forefront of people's thinking by any manner of means, whereas these uh, other things have survived and continue to survive uh, in, in the present thing. So when we talk, we talk about Moses, everybody, yeah, Moses, oh yeah, Moses, you know, right, and they, Carlton Heston, and this guy with, you know, with lightning behind him, and also kind of Walt Disney images, you know, and he's got these tablets in his hand, and he's got this big stick and long white hair and the robes, and, you know, that's, okay, now we know, oh yeah, right, they divided the sea, and you know, oh right, you know, like this, but you know, what really happened in the story of the life of Musa alayhi salam is really not known. Nor is the life of Adam and Hawa known, nor is the life of Noah known, nor is the life of Ibrahim known, nor is the life of Musa known, the life of Isa known, or the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam in many instances, even inside of the Muslim community, is not known. Only superficial things are known. So what can you do about it? There's nothing much you can do about it, but we can do something about it on a small scale, perhaps. You know, at least you can attempt to do something about it. So these week, these monthly meetings, you know, based upon you know the uh, basic idea of Sidna uh, Abdul Qadir Jalani, the Kadassa Lao who you know he, uh, who had these uh, meetings called Garway Sharif, which these are not. 
But his idea was to bring people together once a month uh, from the larger community rather than the people that he speaks with on a more frequent basis uh, to discuss uh, certain aspects of the dean. So that idea of you know bringing people together once a month is you know uh, comes from uh, you know his thinking, and uh, it's of course not Yarwi Sharif in the, in the traditional way of what how it's done, but it is in so far as that it tries to bring together people uh, on a, on a wider scale of uh, say you know a, a, a certain two or three hundred mile section of the central uh, Atlantic states, and alhamdulillah by the uh, introduction of the, this uh, uh, technology of the uh, of the YouTube, it's allowed us to reach uh, people all over the world. So, uh, alhamdulillah, we've seen it be able to grow, and this is our fourth year from something that was you know just really totally local to something which is now uh, able to reach all over the world. Alhamdulillah, and our hope is and our prayer is that it will be a means of people knowing more about whatever the aspects are of that particular meeting that we're having. And today's meeting is about the Prophet Musa salam. And so having that, putting that behind me, uh, uh, start inshallah. Allah says in the Quran, uh, in uh, Surah Maryam, وَذْكُرْ فِي كِتَابِ Musa And remember in the book Musa, Innahu kana mukhlasan wa kana rasulun nabiya. He was truly sincere and a messenger wa kana rasulun. He was a messenger, nabiya, and he was a prophet. So a few things, mukhlasan, very important word, the idea of, of sincerity is a very important aspect of things. Wa kana rasulun means that he came with a book, in other words, in this case the Torah, uh, and uh, th this book becomes a uh, uh, the, the, the means of guiding many, many, many generations of people. And then Nabiya, Nabiya means literally uh, one who, who wakens people. And Nabiyas don't necessarily bring a book, but they serve in generation after generation, these Nabiyas, uh, as in Bani Israel, and also in some of the Arab prophets, as awakeners of the people to the understanding of the uh, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's not like anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And bringing people back to that, back from paganism, back from uh, shirk, you know, from associationism, uh, and so on and so forth. As we saw in the uh, our uh, understanding of Sidna Ibrahim, Alayhi salam and his, uh, you know, how uh, Malik uh, Sadiq, you know, the righteous king, you know, taught him, you know, in his teachings about, you know, he first he worshipped the stars and then he saw the stars set and then he said, uh, oh, I, how could I worship the stars? You know, and this refers to, of course, to all those ideas of astrology and uh, all of those particular things. Then he worshipped the moon. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, the moon, you know, that's bright, you know, that's bright, brighter. And then, and, uh, you know, but then instead of the moon sets, you say, okay, well, that can't be a law because it, it goes down, it sets, you know, even though it's a bright light, it sets, you know, and that, the whole psychic realm and everything like that. And then the idea of worshiping the sun, you know, which is, you know, a predilection of pagan Christianity, which it fell into taking off from, you know, uh, Egyptian pagan thought, you know, the worship of the sun, Ra, you know, and all that goes with that. And then he saw that that set. He said, I don't worship any of those. I worship that which created it all. And that's what we mean by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which created everything. But is it difficult for people to understand the law, very difficult for the, the, the various messengers who came to explain the law to the people because you can't see them. Nobody's seen the law. Nobody's seen the law. None of these prophets have seen the law. This is Allah in his, in his condition as it's referred to in, in Latin as Deus Abscondicus. That is, the Allah that cannot be seen will never be seen, will not be known, and whatever idea that you have of that Allah will not be the Allah that is in any case, because it's not possible. And then you have Deus Revelatus, which is the Allah which is apparent, beginning with the, the in, in, in Islam anyway, with the two most 
prominent things are Rahman the Rahim, merciful and giver of individual giver of mercy. And then through the various Asma Allah al Husna Allah Rahman Rahim Al Malik al Qudus Al Salam Al Mu'min Al Muhaymin Al Aziz Al Jabbar Al Mutakabir Al Khalik Al Bari Al Musawir Al Ghafar Al Kahar to Asabur the patient. We understand something about Allah that we can't see by these signs by which we get some idea as to the nature of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But again, nobody's ever seen the law. So the prophets always have a very tough time, peace be upon them all, in how they explain it to people because they're trying to explain something that nobody can see. Nobody can taste, nobody can smell, nobody can hear, you know, nobody, everything like that. So it's a very difficult job. So that's what he says. He says, this guy Musa was quote for Kitab Musa, and remember in the book Musa, alayhi salam, he was sincere, and this is always very important in my own Shaykh, Allah Hamhu, was very insistent upon sincerity, is the very first thing, the most important thing in any student, in any student, is sincerity. Without ikhlas, without sincerity, we know, Kulhu Allahu had the surah that's named after, surah ikhlas, we know how essential that this idea of of sincerity is. If you're not sincere, you'll get nowhere. You get nowhere. If you're just a hypnotist collector and out shopping on a shopping trip and so on and so forth like that, and digging little holes, or oh, I'm digging a little Buddhist hole over here, a little uh, Hindu hole over here, a little Islamic hole over here, a little Buddhist hole over here, and you dig these little holes, you're never going to get anywhere. You just get little holes. You got to dig deep. And to dig deep, you have to be sincere. Be sincere means it takes time to dig deep. You have to put a lot of effort into it over a long period of time, good times and bad times, expansion and contraction and so on and so forth. This shows the person is mukhlis. And so Allah says of, of Musa, Musa was mukhlis. We know this because he spent 18 years with his teacher in doing that. It's called breaking your legs. It, it took him that much time to really reach to that point when he only had to spend 12. That's all the teacher asked him for was 12 years. He gave, all he asked him for was 8 years. He said, if you give me 12 years, I'd appreciate it. But he gave him 18. So he was mukhlis. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a book. The Decalogue is part of that book, the Ten Commandments and various other things. All of these things which are an essential part of everybody's life, I mean, have changed the entire world from the time he lived until now. The world is different because Musa lived. His work changed the world, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, whether even you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever you happen to be, you have to deal with Directly, either with directly with Sidna Musa alayhi salam, or indirectly with Sidna Musa alayhi salam, in terms of the uh, effects of his teaching upon civilization, upon society, upon the uh, uh, the the in terms of say of the Ten Commandments, in terms of just the way uh, society organizes them, what what you can do, what you can't do, and so on and so forth. The basis of law and all of these other things all comes from his book, because that's what Allah says. What what kind of Rasulun? That he was a Rasul, a Rasul. He had a message. He brought a message. One Nabiya also that he awakened the people. So that's how it begins. So the name Musa, Allah Salam, the name Musa, means actually pulled from the water. That's what the meaning of his name means, and you'll understand why. And Alhamdulillah, uh, in, in uh, Moses, as he's known also in English, so you understand, there's no doubt about who I'm talking about. He's mentioned 126 times by name. He's almost the most, I think he is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran. And beyond the mention, 100, 126 times, there are 19 distinct stories, that's, that is narratives, about Musa salam, in the Quran. And uh, remember when I talked about Sidna Ibrahim, the difference between, say, Quran and Torah is the Torah is a, has a lot of a lot of uh, or, 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 a lot of stories, a lot of narratives. 
a lot of narratives. The Quran has very few narratives because those stories that were in the Torah, those stories that were in, uh, in, in, in the Injil and everything like that, had been passed to the people. That they were like common knowledge. It's like the television of the day was the contents of, of, of those books. So everybody knew about those things. So that when Allah, because there is the development of religion in time, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the Quran, it wasn't necessary to tell all these long, who begat who, and this was the son of that, and the daughter of this, and this was married to this, and this was married to that, and this is this one's auntie, and this one's uncle, and so on. It was not necessary to go through all of that, and he did this, and he did that, and so on. He went here, and he went there. All these things not necessary to mention, because people knew about that. But they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran takes certain instances from the lives of these people and makes these things appear before us in the Quran and then explain to us the meaning of these particular things. But in the case of Sidna Musa alayhi salam, it's very different from any other prophet in the, in the Quran. We find that there are 19 different stories about him. And nothing, I'm not saying anything mystical about the number 19 or anything like that, just the number in this case. And I only have an hour, an hour and 15 minutes to talk, and it's obvious that I cannot even begin to touch, you know, any of this. So I have to be very selective, and even then I'm not going to actually get through it because I never get through it. And But I, my hope is to tell you how it went up to the parting of the sea. And if I don't get to do that, I'll do it on the, uh, on the Google thing, and whatever it is, the YouTube thing. And you'll be able to see it in two or three parts, like we did with Sidna Ibrahim alayhi salam. In any case, so in Surat Qasas, uh, Surat al Qasas, um, and, and uh, because most people don't speak Arabic here, uh, rather than, than going through the Arabic, but I'll just tell you what, what it says. It says, when Mu Musa completed his term of service, and we'll talk more about that. And he was traveling with his family in the desert. He saw a fire from the direction of the mountain. And most people understand this to mean Mount Sinai or like that, you know. And he said to his family, and you'll know more, understand more about the circumstances, and he says, wait here. I see a fire far off, and perhaps I can bring you some news about what's going on, about where we are, because they got lost, and what way we should take. Or maybe I'll bring some, you know, fire uh, to kindle a fire and warm yourself because he was traveling with his wife, who was expectant at that time. So this is the basic, basic story. Other accounts at uh, the beginning of his life. Other accounts which occur in, in uh, Surah 20 and Surah 27 are similar, but this one mentions an important part of the information which has to do with Musa, which I explained a little bit about having to do with that he had completed his term, and uh, you know al ajab What do we mean by this term? So we have to go back to the beginning and understand. First of all, Musa alayhi salam was born into the family of Imran, uh, of the clan of the Levites. And he was in the priestly clan of the Jewish people, or they weren't Jewish at that time, Beni Israel, who were living in Egypt in a time when the ruling pharaoh, Firaun, had enslaved them after the time of the Prophet Yusuf. When Prophet Yusuf salam, lived in Egypt, the, the Beni Israel occupied a very high position because he had essentially saved the country, and many, many people from Beni Israel had come to live in Egypt. Like, say, similar to what in Germany or similar in, in America. And that went on for a while, but the Firaun, the Firaun, by, by definition, is the, in, in, in the religion of the people of Egypt, owned Egypt. He owned everybody. He owned everything. He owned every piece of land, every house, every, everything belonged to the Pharaoh. And in addition to belonging to him, he was a, a quote-unquote, a god. In other words, whatever he did was what it was, and he could do whatever he wanted to do. And what he did was he enslaved Beni Israel as a convenient workforce by that time, because they were a minority population of some seven, three quarters of a million people to a million people who were living inside of Egypt at that time. He enslaved them. 
not that his own people were enslaved at a different level, but he actually enslaved these people in, in the way that there were slaves in America uh, in the 1800s, for instance. That kind of slave. So he was born into that milieu, that, that dimension. And some of his priests and his magicians, because Pharaoh depended upon uh, knowing what to do upon these two very important castes in his things, magicians and priests, priests of the gods, the numerous gods of Egypt, and also magicians, to know they were like his state department, what to do. So they came and said that they had gotten these messages that there was going to come somebody from Beni Israel who was going to kill him and destroy his kingdom. So naturally, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, was uh, very upsetting to him, needless to say, but he could do something about it, and what he would decide to do about it was to kill every Jewish boy, every, every boy from Beni Israel. That way he's not going to have any problem, because they'll be dead. But then his ministers came to him and said, look, you've got to be careful about this, because if you kill them all off, we're not going to have any slaves. And we need them to be slaves, so let's look into this further. So they did further magic and, you know, uh, you know, examination of the stars and everything like that. And they concluded that there was a year, a particular year, in which that this was most likely to happen, and a few other years that it could happen, but this year it was most likely to happen. So that year, kill every Jewish, kill every, uh, every child, a boy child of Ben Israel to be safe. And his brother, Harun, who was older than him, happened to be born in one of the other years, so he was no problem. But Musa, alayhi salam, was born in that year that the magicians and the priests had identified as the dangerous year that the, it would, that the killer, that the destroyer of Firam, which was of course true, would come and destroy him from that, that particular uh, age, that particular year of the uh, life. And that he told them that, the, the magicians told him how he would be overthrown. He would be overthrown by his tongue and by his fist, by his hand, by his sword, by his sword hand. So this is how he was going to be overthrown. So he knows now, not only are you going to be overthrown, but how he's going to overthrow you is with his mouth and with his power, his kudr, his uh, strength. So they, what they decided to do to figure out how to do this thing was matched by Hitler's machines in, 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 against the Jews during the Second World War. He, what he did, though, what Pharaoh did was he got, he got the services, he enlisted the services of every midwife in Egypt. They were all working for the government. And every midwife was appointed to any house of Beni Israel in which there was a woman who was pregnant. And soldiers were permanently stationed in all the areas where Beni Israel resided. And as soon as any boy child was born, the midwife made a report, the soldiers were called in, the baby was taken away, and slaughtered like that. Some 90,000 male infants were slaughtered in Firaun's plan of horror to thwart the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a single male infant was spared. Now, when Musa salam, was born in that year, the midwife who was appointed by Firaun to deliver the baby took the baby in her hands, and you know how midwives are, and, and like they're very, very, very uh, maternal women for sure. She was overwhelmed by love for this beautiful baby. She had never set eyes on such a beautiful baby. And she told the baby's mother, don't be worried, don't be afraid. She was going to tell the soldiers that it was a dead girl that was born, that was a, uh, the, the, what was born was a dead girl, and that she had buried her outside. And when the midwife left the house, she told the guards outside she had buried the dead baby girl, and the, midwife, and the guards entered the house to confirm a report. Now, Mariam, who is the sister of Musa, the older sister of Musa, alayhi salam, saw the soldiers going into the house, she panicked. 
and she ran to her room and she grabbed the baby blindly, you know, and what you would do in this state of panic, not knowing what she was doing, and she put him in the kitchen stove, which was burning, cooking the me evening meal. The soldiers searched the place, they didn't think to look in the stove, because the stove was burning, right? So searching the place and questioning the mother, Musa, they were satisfied, they left. By the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it never occurred to them, of course, to check the stove. The mother said to the daughter, where's the baby? Where did you put your brother? She said, I put it in the stove. They both panicked. The mother lost her mind. She ran to the fire, and when the mother and the daughter reached the oven, the fire was blazing, and they both began crying. But what did they hear? The pleasant gurgling sound of a baby. And his mother put her hand into the fire and put the, pulled the baby out, and she found Musa salam, unscathed, like Sidna Ibrahim in the fire of Nimrod. The fire had no effect upon him, and on the contrary, he was smiling. Hmm? This is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mother of Musa gave breast to him in secret, suckled him in secret after his birth, because the hunter-killers of Firaun were continuing traveling about the land, killing the boy children wherever they could during this period. But now commenced a very dangerous task, because there's still less a year left. What was she going to do in that year? Because if, he, if that child was discovered within the year, finished for him. She knew this danger was ever-present, as the slaughter continued, it, it never stopped. 90,000 kids were killed, right? So these guys were, the, the killers were always on the lookout for any baby that they could find, boy baby that they could find. Mom's name is Barka, incidentally, the mother of Musa, alayhi salam. She became even more fearful and apprehensive, fearing that her secret would somehow come out, naturally. Allah inspired her with the assurance Oh, I'm going to read it in English, yes. So we revealed to the mother of Musa, alayhi salam, give him, nurse him. If you fear for him, put him in the river, the Nile. The Nile is, the, everything in Egypt is the Nile. The Nile is the life of Egypt. Everything, everybody lives within some relationship with the river. Now put him in the river and don't have any fear or regret, for we will bring him back to you and make him to be from among uh, al Mursaleen, as Allah says, among the bearers of messages. This inspiration brought her, needless to say, great peace and tranquility. But meantime, as this happened, the brutality of Firaun had increased. He systematically, they were going through every house, everywhere, constantly looking for this, and she was really scared that they were going to find the baby. Because all the baby has to like, like that little child making a noise like that, make a little noise like that, the soldier hear it. These guys were ruthless, like the Gestapo. They were ruthless. They find it, kill it. That was their idea. And they got a, 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 you know, a payment for, for round for every one that they killed. Now, when the, w w what she did, she, she saw this and she said, I'll go to this carpenter, and I'm going to have him make a wooden box, like a coffin or an ark, and I'll put him in the ark, and I'll do what Allah says. I'll put him in the river, and he'll go off in the river in this boat, and Allah will take care of it somehow. So she talked to Imran, who's the father of Musa, and Imran, who trusted the carpenter, told him that the box was stupid, right? Was told him that the box was for concealing his baby from Firaun. And the baby would be concealed in this ark. You build this ark, and we'll put the baby in it, or my wife will, and we'll send him to a safe place. Well, when the car carpenter left Imran, huh, he went right off to the palace to inform Firaun of his discovery, because he knew he'd get paid for it, on top of it. He knew, as it says in the story, he would be munificently rewarded by Firaun for this information. And on reaching the palace, he was ushered into the presence of Firaun. And once he was in the presence of Firaun, as much as he tried to explain what he knew, he was unable to do so. He became dumb. And he could not enter, oh, yeah, he's talking like this, but he couldn't say anything. He couldn't make, all he could do was make incoherent and incomprehensible sounds. And this really annoyed and angered Firaun. And thinking that the carpenter was joking and wasting his time, he ordered him to be whipped and thrown out of the palace. And after a severe whipping, the carpenter was thrown out. And then reaching home, he, dis he, he resolved, because he wanted that money, to inform Firaun of the baby, of the hidden baby, by means of a letter. 
but when he sat down to write this letter, he became blind. And he was overcome with panic, and then he understood that the baby for whom this ark was being made was in reality the very same infant about whom the astrologers had predicted would be the doom of Pharaoh, and that this, nebi, this baby would be the Nebi. And he repented, and as he repented, Allah restored his sight. And he accepted the baby as the Nebi. Look at this. He was the first person among the Kiptia, that's the Copts or the people of Pharaoh, the Egyptian people, Egyptia, Egypt, Copt, all those words, to accept the Prophet Musa. He accepted him, right, by this act. And he, he resolved that he would build this thing really well so that, you know, that it would be safe. And the mother of Nebi Musa, alayhi salam, examined it when he brought it to the ark and she blocked off any opening or crevice to prevent any water that would enter and she prepared the ark, bathed her infant, dressed him up beautifully, hugged him, kissed him lovingly and with tears in her eyes, put him in the ark, closed it, put it in the river in the middle of the night and off the ark went. That's what she did. That was her trust of Allah. But Allah says, Tie your camel's leg and trust in Allah. So how did she tie the camel's leg? She told her daughter Maryam, you go and you watch that thing where that thing goes and where it goes and let me know what happens. Because she's a girl walking innocently along. It's not a boy, nothing, no problem. She'll see where the ark goes and she'll come back to her mom and tell her what's going on. When, oh, I forgot to tell one, one part of the thing. When she put the ark, which she carried on her head, when she put that ark in the, in the, in the river, there was, there was a, a huge poisonous snake that was coiled up. You have to understand that Egypt was the land where the, was the end of the Saurian Empire. Saurian means reptiles. It's like, kind of like Florida. Florida and America, you know, and it's kind of it's still Saurian place. It's, you know, like you got to watch out when you go out in your yard. There can be an, an alligator in your yard, right? Anybody who lived in Florida, right? You got to carry a stick if you're a gardener, right? Because it could be an alligator in your flower bed, right? So, in Egypt, which was of course a riverous land, a land of uh, you know rivers and, and uh, the Nile and everything, and swamps and everything like that. That that's why when you see the pharaohs head dresses and everything, you always see snakes and crocodiles and things like that. This was their struggle. Like the, the, the struggle in Egypt was to put an end to the, the reptiles. And there were reptiles, there were snakes and crocodiles and these things everywhere, everywhere. So when she went to put it in the water, she saw this big snake. And the snake talked to her in her own language and said, look, if you put this in the river, I'm going to eat your baby. But the mother of Musa salam, was a very saintly and intelligent woman. She understood that this was shaitan. And she said, A'udhu billahi min shaitan in rajim. Boom, the snake's gone. She took the name of Allah. She assigned the ark to the waters of the Nile with her sincerity, with her tears coming down her cheek, his eyes following the ark until it disappeared from her sight into the night. Full of grief, she returned home. Maryam followed the course of the ark and, and reported back to her. And she followed the ark along the river and she saw the ark was discovered the next day by who? The wife of Firaun, Asiya, alayha salam. And you'll see why I say alayha salam, peace be upon her, who took Musa home. When Firaun saw the child, he was alarmed. Where is this from? Maybe this is the guy who's after me. So Musa, because you remember, like if you when you read the story of Isa alayhi salam, you know when the mother, when the people called her mother a prostitute and so on, his mother a prostitute and so on and so forth. He began to talk to defend his mother when he was only like three days old in the cradle. He's defending his mother. He said, "What are you saying about my mother? How are you talking about my mother that way to say that she's a prostitute? This is who I am. This is what it is. Never mind that." In other words. At the age of three days old, he's talking. This is not possible. Well, at the same age, Musa, who's a, a tiny baby at this point, he understands the mind of Firaun. He can see that this guy is the threat to him. So what does he do? <coughs> <According to, coughs> there's two stories. According to one story, he, he's lying, Asiya has put him by the fireplace, and he's lying by the He reaches into the fireplace, and he grabs some hot coals, 
and he sticks them in his mouth like they were candy. So with one sweep of the thing, what does he do? He burns his hand, huh? burns his hand, and he burns his mouth. So Pharaoh knows from the magicians how is he going to be killed. He's going to be killed by a guy who's either going to kill him with his mouth. Now the, the mouth of the child is ruined, right? Because his tongue is burnt. So he can't speak well, never could speak well, Musa, alayhi salam. And his hand is burnt. The hand that would carry the sword is burnt. So he puts the Pharaoh's fears to rest by doing this. And another story that's told, <coughs> the Pharaoh was very suspicious about it, and he put in front of the baby two plates. One was filled with rubies and jewels and all kinds of things, and the other was filled with fire, uh, coals from the fire, and the baby took the coals from the fire with the same thing. He took the coals and put the coals in his mouth. Same, same thing. Burnt his hand, burnt his mouth. Different stories. You don't know. I mean, it's a long time ago. I do the best I can. Anyway, in another, in another story, there is a third story about it, which is that one day he was playing, later on, he was playing in the lap of Firaun, and he grabbed his beard. And on beards in Egypt, only the Firaun could have a beard. You notice when you go to look at it's Firauns and ministers and certain people, you know, the beard that was like, you know, they would wax it. You know, like Salvador Dali used to wax his mustache. They'd wax his beard like that, and it would be in a certain way like that. This was... Uh, part of being the Firaun or certain people of nobility and royalty could have these things, otherwise you couldn't. So Musa, like that, he grabs on it like that and yanks it, and Firaun begins to say, man, this is the guy. But anyway, that's another story about it, you know. Anyway, I see, I said, no, he's just a kid, he's playing, leave him alone, never mind. This would happen later. So, now the next problem was that this was a tiny baby, how were they going to feed the baby? So Allah says in the Quran, when Asiya, she ordered to find a wet nurse for Musa, he refused to be breastfed. This woman came, that woman came, the other woman came, no. Because Allah had forbidden Musa from being fed by any wet nurse, so as to reunite him, as you'll see, with his mom, with his mother. Sid Maryam worried that Musa had not been fed for some time, because she was hanging out, watching what was going on, reporting back to her mom, she told her mom, maybe, you know, you should, you know, and she told Asiya, I know a lady, you know, who could breastfeed him for you. And uh, in, uh, Allah says in the Surah Quran, uh, in the Surah Qasas in the Quran, and we restored him to his mother that she, that she might be comforted and not grieved, and that she might know that the promise of Allah is true, but most of them do not know. They don't know this. The child Musa, they they brought the mom to her. Of course, it's his mom. She put him to. Uh, they put Musa to her breast. Immediately, he starts suckling. And Pharaoh is astonished. He says, "Who are you?" And now again, because he's paranoid about this whole thing, because the magicians and the astrologers have scared him, right? And the child. Why does this child refuse to take any other breast but yours? I mean, who are you? She couldn't tell him the truth. This is my son, right? Because he knows that she's an Israelite. So she would have killed, he would have killed Musa immediately. But Allah gave her an inner strength and she replied to him and she said, I am a woman of sweet milk and sweet smell and no child refuses me. Mm. This answer satisfied the Firon and the woman was appointed to be the wet nurse, that's his mom, and she, of course, breastfed him for a long time. As he was getting bigger and weaned, she was granted the privilege of visiting him and Musa, Along with, along with his brother Harun, salam, was raised in the palace of Firaun, and he went to school for the children of the house of Firaun. So he not only gained a very high level of education, but he came to understand the inner workings of the court of Firaun, both secular and perhaps more importantly religious. For, as the Greek historian Herodotus has said, there are no more religious people than the people of Egypt. The result of this was that although both he and his brother were for Beni Israel, to any casual observer who would they would appear to be princes, living in the court of Firaun, going to the school with his children, with uh, the children of the nobility and everything like the best education, you know, Yale, Harvard, you know, the whole deal, you know, that's the education that they got. That's the education Musa and Harun got. You have to understand that. This is how they were brought up. They were brought up at the top, the top, top, top of the pyramid. Best, everything the best. This is where they're coming from. 
And their mother, Barcha, uh, who also has a other name, Yohanath and Yesmad. There's a other names of her, but I use the name Barcha because it's related to Baraka in some way, though it's not. Was his mother in the ways of Benny Israel so that Musa grew up knowing that he was not really the son of Firon. He was not even an Egyptian, but he was the son of Imran from the clan of Levi, who came from the family of Nebi Yaqub, and, and further knew that Nebi Yusuf Aleisam, had saved Egypt from famine hundreds of years before, so he knew his history. So he knew both his, his Islamic history, or his, his Beni Israel history, of, of, of the, the reality of, of, of that teaching, as well as he knew uh, the teachings uh, from the, the, the schools of Firaun and the house of Firaun. So he came, came with this thing. And I have in the, in the thing a, a chart that shows you know, all of his descendants and where he comes from and so on and so forth, which if you get the book you can read and you can see. Also of a great significance was that the teachings of his mom also gently, huh, gently reached the ear of the kind-hearted wife of Firon, who was still the wife of Firon, Asiya. And gradually, gradually, shwaya shwaya, she was brought into the way of Tawheed, or monotheism. It's firmly believed that by all Muslims, that Asiya, alayhi salam, became in time, and you will see the reasons why, a sincere believer who fully submitted herself to Allah, despite her being the wife of Firon, Despite her being an Egyptian, despite her coming from the Mushrikeen and everything like that, she came to Islam, or she came to the belief in the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to Hadith, she was one of the first women to enter the paradise, because she took the way of Tawheed over Firaun's way in the midst of everything. She had everything in life, but she took that way, and she paid for it very heavily, you'll see. And indeed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentioned her as one of the four greatest women of all time, besides Maryam, alayhi salam, the, wife, uh, the, the mother of Isa, alayhi salam, and his own wife, Khadija, alayhi salam, and his daughter, Fatima, alayhi salam. These four women, these are considered the greatest of women in the world. Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima. Peace be upon them all. And they all mention uh, to be examples of all time. He says, Allah says in Surah Tahrim, Allah sets forth as an example to those who believe the wife of Firaun. Behold, she said, Ya Rabbi, O my Lord, build from me a house in the garden near to you and save me from Firaun and his doings and save me from the evildoers. This, is, this was his second mom, you might say, his adopted mom. Now, one day he's out going about the city and he's in his late teens and he comes across some guys fighting in the street. One of them is an Egyptian and the other is a member of his own tribe, Beni Israel, and they're having a fist fight in the street. And the guy from Beni Israel is getting the worst of it. And he begs him, help me in my fight against the Egyptian. And Musa, alayhi salam, teenager, late teenager, 19 years old, 21 years old, something like that, intervenes in the fight, you know how those things go, and he becomes involved in the fight, and he smacks the Egyptian, he, he not only smacks him, he punches him with his fist in a state of anger that results in the death of the Egyptian. Musa, alayhi salam, immediately, because he's a prophet, right, inside of himself, he repents for what he realized he's done something terribly wrong. I mean, okay, you go and help your fellow man, but you don't kill the guy in the, in the process for a street fight. And it was totally out of proportion to the scale of what was going on. Allah says, the, the story is told in the Quran, one day he entered the city at a time when most of the people were resting in their houses, unaware of what was going on in the streets, and, they found two, and he found two men fighting there, one from his own people and the other from the enemy. And one from his people asked him to support him against the enemy. Musa hit him, and he dealt him a fatal blow. And then he said to himself, this is from shaitan. Truly, shaitan is a, is a misleading enemy. In other words, 
he lost his temper. He, 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 he came from his high state down into the state of anger and like that. And he said to Allah, Oh Allah, I have wronged my soul, so forgive me. Huh? Call it Rabbi Inni the Lamtu Nafsi Fagfirli Fafara Lahu and forgive me. And Allah forgave him. In who who will go for Rahim? Because Allah is the forgiving and the merciful. Because the man, even though he was some in the same tribe as Musa, he appeared that he was a troublemaker because of the way the fight was had gone. He said also, in addition to that, in a different place, O oh my sustainer, O oh my Lord, by all the blessings that you have granted me, never more shall I will be one who aids those who are in wrongdoing. He really makes big toba to Allah. The next day he comes back into the town, he finds the same guy embroiled in the fight again. This caused him to understand that he had taken completely taken the side of a troublemaker. Even though he felt that the, he was he was aiding an oppressed fellow tribesman, but that was not the case. But worse than that, the news that Musa had murdered a man spread far and wide, and the local people were enraged, and they hatched a plan to kill Musa. Allah says in the Quran, a man came running from the furthest part of the city saying to Musa, Ya Musa, they are conspiring to kill you, so leave. I am somebody who is bringing you good advice. What's he do? He got to leave town. So, Bismillah. Musa packs up all of his luggage that he can think of, gets a camel, and flees from the palace of Firaun in the pitch dark when everybody soundly asleep. And he decides he's going to go to a place called Madian or Midian, it has two different names, which is an Arab land somewhere in, uh, in the vicinity of Ma'in, which is south of Amman in what is present day Jordan. And it's about, it's below sea level. It's known for thermal mineral hot springs. It has waterfalls. And people live there for centuries. They go there for thermal treatments. It's a good place, in other words, a healthy place. And it is in the desert far away from Egypt where the power of Pharaoh doesn't reach or reaches minimally. No one in Midian goes to bed in fear of the guards of Pharaoh or his evil. He knew this because, of course, he studied all of these things, and so he decides to leave behind when he left the palace. He's going to go there. And he's, and he's also by coincidence that the name Midian is similar to the letters in the word Medina, and it is Musa Ahidra, as was the journey of the Prophet ﷺ to Yathrib, which became known as Medina to Nebi, also Hijra. So it's, it's a similar word to Medina, but it's Midian or Madian. So he turns his face to the direction of Madian, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Qasas, and he says, hopefully Allah will guide me to the right way. It takes him eight days to cross the desert, and he finally reaches Midian, and after watering his camel, he decides he's going to rest in the shade and, and relax like that. And he's relaxing in the shade like this, and he looks around and he sees there's these two girls over there. And everybody is there watering their, their sheep and their goats and their camels and everything, the big guys. And these two girls are not getting, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get to water their sheep because everybody else is pushing and shoving and everything else like that. So Musa, in spite of being very tired, Salam, instead of being very tired, gets up and goes to help them. He says, something I can do for you? Can I help you? Or something like that. And they said, yes, you know, like we're our dad is... Very, our father is very old, he's partially blind, uh, you know, it's just my sister and I, and, you know, we can't get through, and so on and so forth. So Musa, who is, by the way, as you can tell, because when he hit the guy with his fist, he's a very well-proportioned big man, you know, or a big, you know, 22-year-old boy, you know, like that. He goes and he pushes his way through, and he waters the sheep. And the girls are very happy. For what he's done, and he and he's very, you know, very super polite. He's very tired, but nevertheless, he does this because he said, "This is the na you can see the nature of Musa." So he watered the sheep, and they took the sheep. They went home, and he went back to rest in the shade. 
very tired after that eight-day journey. And during that journey, it's also, he didn't bring enough food. And there's more in the story about eight, but I don't want to tell you about all of that. But it was a difficult trip. And he was very hungry as well as being very tired. And then he sees, as Allah says in Surah Qasaz, he says, one of the two girls came walking shyly up to him and said, my father is asking you to come home so that he may reward you for watering our flocks for us. So when Musa came to their father and gave him his story, he says, fear not, you have escaped from these wrongdoing people. So now he's in the home of the girl's father. Now, they say he's an old man, right? My father's an old man. What is the word for old man in Arabic? Sheikh. Huh? My father is a sheikh. Hmm? Not only that, it turns out he is the prophet Shuaib, alayhi salam. Meaning, Shuaib in, in Arabic means the one who shows the right path. He was an ancient Midianite prophet who is sometimes identified in the, with the biblical prophet Jethro. Although Islam attributes to him many other deeds that are not mentioned in the Bible and it's questionable whether he is Jethro or not Jethro, but he is Shuaib, alayhi salam. And he's mentioned in the Quran a lot of times and so on and so forth. He was a follower of the teachings of the Prophet Ibrahim four layers back. There's, uh, I'll tell you the names of those people, uh, who it goes back to. Anyway, he was sent as a prophet to two communities, the Midianites, and one, and the people of the wood, Asab al Aikha, the other people. And both of these people, he told them the same story. Them, Allah is one. You know, this is what they always say, Allah is one. Now, you have a hard time explaining to people Allah is one, believe me. You know, Charlottesville, Virginia, you go walking around telling people, listen, Allah is one. I mean, you don't get very far. I've tried. Numbers of years here. You know, they, you know people say, oh, that's mm -hmm. yeah, very, very interesting, and so on and so forth like that. And because, you know, what's a sophisticated, relatively speaking, university town, they may give you a little bit of ear. But, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to them. A few, as Allah says, Khalil and Minhum, a few amongst them will listen to what you're saying. Oh, yeah, it's nice. Oh, I like your, I like your, like your clothes. I like your thing. Oh, your beard is nice. You, oh, you got a stick. They'll talk about all those things. But about the real thing, Kul hu, Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. They don't talk about that. They don't want to know about that. They want to know not only that, but Allah has spoken to us. Allah has ordered us to do certain things. Ordered us. Not said, you know, you know, if you're feeling up to it or, you know, you're not busy with doing your uh, this or that or the other things, you might, you know, might do these things, you know. No, he said order, this order. Allah ordered everybody to pray. Obama is ordered to pray. He doesn't know it, but he's ordered to pray. Putin is ordered to pray. The new president of China, he's ordered to pray. The president of India, he's everybody in the world is ordered to pray. Not for Allah. Allah doesn't need it. For himself. Means of changing yourself. Everybody's ordered to fast. Everybody is ordered to pay zakat, to give part of your money to the poor in certain categories. Everybody is ordered to make hajj. Everybody is ordered to say la ilaha illallah. Everybody's ordered to do that. Ordered. Not asked. It's an order of Allah. If you don't do it, it's because you say either I don't hear Allah, I don't recognize Allah, I don't believe in Allah, I can do what I want myself. It's called the pick and choose school, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra school, I'll do it my way. No, it's not like that. So that's what I say. You try to tell that people that in Charlottesville, you don't get very far. They say, well, Friday night I got to go to the Shabbat, you know, and then Sunday morning we got a Christian service going. You know, I mean, these are the more spiritual ones, you know, or something like that. You know, forget about it. Orders? No, there's no such thing as orders. This is a liberal world, after all. You know, hey. So anyway, that's the way it is. So he was ordered to go and tell these people about those things, but you can imagine they didn't get very far. He didn't get very far with them, and Allah wound up destroying them the way he destroyed the people of Nuh uh, and, and so forth, because this happens. You know, Allah is very serious. You know, it's a serious business. You know, when Allah orders you to do something, you better listen. You know, if you don't listen, that's your business anyway. 
Shuaib is one of the few of the Arabian prophets versus the prophets of Bani Israel who are mentioned by the names of the other ones being Saleh and Hud and Ismail and Muhammad himself. The rest are all known from Bani Israel mainly. Uh, there's a question about, uh, I don't remember his name right now, the very wise man uh, from uh, Southeast Asia. I can't remember his name right now. It'll come to me, inshallah. In any case, so so much for that. Shuaib, that's who Shuaib was. He was somebody who was called by Allah to call to these people of the woods and these people of the Midian to come to Allah. And th these people lived mainly east of Mount Sinai and the people of Midian or Madian or like this, they were notorious for cheating. And they were notorious for dishonesty. It's a tourist town. And of course, they made the immense mistake of idolatry, because that's the real mistake always. Uh, you know, like the rain god, the snow god, the tree god, the wood god, the Lexus god, the trophy wife god, uh, the uh, big house god, you know, all those various gods that people worship. You know, they call them in, uh, I've told you before, they call them in, in Egypt, uh, 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 Abu Musardi, uh, uh, Abdul Musardi, you know, the people who worship Mercedes. Right? It's, it's, that's the gods of the present time. Don't don't fool yourself. Still going on, still going on. Hmm? Anyway, this is who. So he, he told the people, say, you know, stop this. And ah, man, he, he preached. He probably did all these things, but most of the people didn't listen to him. And they rejected his message. But he remained steadfast, and he continued to preach powerfully against these people. He kept telling them what Allah's orders are. He did all these things, but the people didn't pay attention to him. And this is usually the case. Even the Prophet, how many people did he gain in all those years, 13 years? 170 people. And he's the Prophet of Allah. So his mouth is most eloquent, and, and his words are the most fantastic. And everything, like all he reached is 170 people. MashaAllah, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Sidna, Alhamdulillah, Barakallah, Fiqh. Thank you so much for coming, Sid. And so that's all he reached was 170 people. And all of that time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is nothing new, the fact that Shuai was in this town and calling the people. People weren't paying attention. This is normal. And not only that, the people used to taunt him, just the way they taunted the Prophet of the Sunday, he threw the guts of the sheep on his back when he was praying. They, they would stand in front of him when he was praying, and they'd laugh at him and say, what a fool he was, and all of these things. This is the normal way of the people in a really nasty place. You know, you can be, you know, this is a nice, Charlottesville is, you know, uh, what they call Seaville, it's a, uh, you know, a civil. You know, I mean, they, they don't do those things to you. But, you know, anyway, that's the way it goes. So he said, they they thought that he was really they thought he was really something because of who he came from, his background. He says to them, he said, people, do you, do you esteem? Do you think I'm somebody great because uh, of my clan? But you made him, any meaning Allah, something to cast with contempt behind your backs. Allah encompasses everything you do, because he he had the prestige of being you know from. The the uh, a very high clan and everything like that. That's the only reason they respected him was because that's who he was from. But what he was talking about, forget about it. They're not listening. They're not interested in listening. So he told them that he said all of this. By the way, folks, is just a background so you understand who this guy Shuaib alayhi salam was, who invited Musa into his house because of his kindness that he had shown his daughters, because he was by that time partially blind, he couldn't see to go and water the sheep himself, and whatever was happening, in actuality what was really happening was eating in the Hakika with his student Musa alayhi his sheikh. And this was how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was both answering the, the supplication of dua and putting Musa on the path. Because he wasn't on the path before then. He had learned about this. He had learned about that. He had learned about Beni Israel. He had learned about the, the, the most modern teachings of in, in the, the highest universities of his time, in the teachings of Firaun. He knew all about both of those worlds, but he wasn't on the path. This man put him on the path, Shuaib. But all it looks like is that you know, he's watered the, the sheep, and Shuaib has invited him home, 
and he's going to give him, you know, some dinner and like that, and, and Musa is very hungry and everything like that. So everything, that's the way a lot works. So after the dinner is over, Musa Alayhisam told his story, and Shwaib said to him, this, 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 this guy is from, he can't see very well, but he, he can hear and feel, and he knows, and he gets the vibration. And he says, this man is from the family of the Anbiya. And he, he said to Musa Alayhisam, he told him, relax, Firon's not here. You don't have to be any, you just, just, just relax. And, and tell me about it. So when Musa began to talk, he hears in Musa's words honesty and righteousness and integrity. And Shuaib was elated by what he heard, alayhi salam. And he immediately gets the intention to marry Shuaib to one of his daughters. That's how much, because what's he going to do, right? Because he's got to stay in the house, you know, because he, he knows this is my student, and he's going, to, he's going to be a student, he's got to stay with him, so he's going to marry him to one of his daughters. But he tells to Musa, he says, look, I'm going to, I want you to marry my daughter. <laughs> this guy is 22 years old, he's come all this way like that, and suddenly he's met his teacher, and now he's met his wife. And he says, the only condition that you're going to be a shepherd, because all of the MBA take care of sheep. They all take care of cows, they take care of... They all, this is their job. They always have a job to take care of the animals. So you're going to have to do this for eight years, he tells him. And he says, but, he says, if you could give me ten, I'd, I'd be really happy. Musa says, okay, no problem. He says, Shuaib says, this is what Allah says in the Quran, Shuaib said, I want you to marry one of the two daughters of mine on condition you work for me for eight full years but if you complete 10, it's up to you. I don't want to be hard on you. You'll find me to be one of the Salihun. He's talking about himself, Shwai. Musa says, agreed. Whichever term I fulfill, no injustice will be done to me and Allah is witness to our agreement. Just like that. So one night, he comes, walks eight days, he comes, he waters the sheep, says to come in, meet my daughter, you're going to marry my daughter, are you going to marry your daughter, okay, you're going to be with me for eight years, if you give me ten years, it would be better, okay, no problem, I'll give you ten years, okay, that's the way it is, because he met his sheikh, he met, that's the man who is put him on his way, taking to Allah, he knows, and the other man knows, they both know what's the story, even though it may not appear that they know, but that's, what, that's what's really happening, this is what we're seeing, he's going to meet Schwab. When Musa accepted the terms, Nebi Shuaib, and I, I, I'm only going to tell you a little bit more. I'm not going to be able to tell you the whole, and not even tell you what I thought I was going to tell you. How much? 15. Yeah, that's good. I can tell that part of the story anyway. But I was going to tell you up to when the parting of the seas, but I'm not going to get anywhere near there. So anyway, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to get to the, you know, to the promised land. N never mind the <laughs> deserts. But anyway, anyway, so Musa Islam, he agrees to everything that Shuaib says now and says, "I'll do it." And that immediately, Shuaib says, okay, we're going to have the nikah, marriage. We're going to get married right away. No more, because he's got to live in the house. He's got to be muhram to the people who's living in the house. He has to be related to the people living in the house. He's to the other sister, that'll be his sister-in-law. You marry this sister or that sister, it doesn't matter which one he marries, really, because they're both sisters. But, you know, now he'll be able to live in the house, and everything will be hunky-dory, as they say. So, Nebi Shuaib, alayhi salam, had in his possession the sticks, the staffs, of 70 of the Anbiya. That's what his, his, uh, his that's, what, that's what he had. 70 sticks of the prophets. And he says, and one of these was a stick that Adam, alayhi salam, brought from the Jannah, from a tree in the Jannah. It was a stick, like the stick, you know, it looked like a shepherd's stick. It was a stick like this. But the wood from it came from a tree in the Jannah. Hmm? So this is from the other world. It's not from this world. This is an extraterrestrial piece of wood. Understand? Not the wood from some tree down the road. This is from the other world, from the Jannah. A piece of the Jannah in this world. And, but when he had, when he had given him that stick, he had been told that this stick was only to be given to somebody called Kalimullah, the word of Allah. The stick is 
when he had gotten the stick because it had been presented to him by, you know, like I have this stick that came to me from a guy who used to kill a camel every week yeah. to feed the people for Sidna Yakut al Arsh. And he gave me a, a stick, which I don't usually carry around with me. This is a very special stick. And he said, I have to promise me when I took the stick that, I, you know, certain conditions for taking the stick, you know, that you have to do this, this, and anyway. Same kind of thing. This is a very special stick. So, anyway, this stick, when he had gotten this stick, he said that the only one you can give this to is to Kalim Allah. You can give it to nobody else but Kalim Allah. And this guy's name is Musa. Well, I said, not Kalim Allah, it's Musa. So, but Allah calls him Kalim Allah. We find out later on in the Quran, he calls him the word of Allah. But we didn't know that at this point. We just know he's Musa, right? So he had no, he just thought it was like a simple, you know, shepherd's staff. And Musa was not appointed yet to be Nebi by Allah. He's just a guy who this is how, I mean, he, he's appointed inside, but outside it all hasn't happened yet that he's known to be a Nebi. He's just known to be, that's who he is, like what we said. So, Schweib tells him, he says, small room back there uh, where this, these 70 sticks are, uh, go bring me one. All 70 of them are there. Just bring me one. So he goes into the room, and what does he bring? He brings the stick, which is the stick from Adam. And and he brings him to Schwab. Schwab can't see, so but you know, I mean, really, so you see, he goes like, no, 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 no. And that's not the one for you. Bring it back. I need to, to bring that back. So Musa tries to bring it back, but when he tries to bring it back, the staff jumps up into his hand. And he when the Prophet described this whole thing, when, what happened, is it took seven times. And each time, Schwab sent him back, and he, said, and, and, he, and he finally said to Musa, said to Nebi Schwab, every time I put this stick someplace else from the pile of the sticks, this staff jumps up into my hand. So Nebi Schwab thinks to himself, what's the mystery here? I'm, this staff is for Kalim Allah, this guy is Musa. And he's reflecting upon this, the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, comes. And the staff, which was just standing on the ground next to Nebi Shuaib, suddenly jumps up like this and goes into the ground, four inches into the ground. Right? And Allah says, through Jibreel, this staff is for the one who can pull it out of the ground. Whoever can pull it out of the ground, this, is, this staff is for him. Mm -hmm. Musa picks the staff up. Schwab can't even pick the staff up. He tries to pick it up. It won't come up. Yeah. Musa tries to pick the staff up. It comes up immediately. Nebi Schwab now understands that this is Kalim Allah. So this is the first time that Musa knows that his name is Kalim Allah. This is how he finds out his identity. The Sheikh, Bismillah, reveals his identity to him. He says, this has got to be Kalim Allah because... He told me that this stick is only for him, and these, you know, these are very precious things. These these sticks, you know, it's not not casual things. And he has seventy to choose from. Seventy, by the way, in Arabic means a lot. It was not not that there were somebody went out there and counted seventy sticks, but seventy means sebain means there are a lot of sticks in that closet. You know, it's like I got a lot of sticks at home, you know. I mean, some of the people give me sticks all the time, you know, like because I need a stick to walk with. So, you know, they give you sticks. So you get a lot of sticks after a while, right? You know, so there were a lot of sticks. But now Schwab is very happy. His daughter is married, and his daughter is married to Kalim Allah. And, and he says, oh, Kalim Allah, ya Musa, congratulations. Blessed is this staff for you. This is no ordinary staff. He's never told him about where the staff came from. He didn't tell him anything about the story. He just said, the wedding present is in that closet. Go get it. Now he tells him about this. That this staff actually comes from a tree in Jannah. Allah. Subhanallah. Imagine that. Imagine that. that. This is really some amazing thing. Okay, so that's this is how he gets married. This is how the whole thing begins and everything like that. And, and as I told you, uh, and I should tell you, he was very happy with his wife. His wife's name is Safura. His daughter's name is Safura. In, in Hebrew, she's called Zipporah. Safura uh, or Safrawa 
or uh, Sephora in Greek, all of these names, means a bird. A little bird. So his wife's name is a little bird. <laughs> That's his sweet wife's name. And, and, and the wife of Musa, the daughter of uh, Shweib, uh, he begins his work. So he's going to go out with his flock for the first time. So Shweib warns him, because Shweib used to take care of the sheep, but now, of course, Shweib's blind, he can't do it. His daughters were doing it, but now this guy to do it like that, you know, much better deal. But he tells him, look, you can take the sheep anywhere to graze, but there's a certain location in the fields. Don't ever go near that place. Don't turn your face in that direction. It's very dangerous, because there's a snake there, and that snake will get the sheep. Don't go there. So he goes to the field, and he observes that all the sheep <laughs> go to exactly where Shuaim told them not to go to. They take off, and they go, they go running to this place. And he's not even able to look at it, he's, because Shuaim told him, don't even look at it, but he looks at it, and he observes this beautiful, lush pastures. I mean, this is the best of the grazing land that there were, and the flock, the flock is all grazing contentedly. And so Musa puts his trust in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes his staff, and he lays down and he goes to sleep. Huh? In spite of what his teacher told him. As soon as he falls asleep, a snake comes. This is a story about snakes. Because I told you this is the, the, the relationship between the human world and the Saurian world. You know, this is a long time back, 4,000 years ago, right? So, just as the snake is going to go and eat the sheep, because what do the sheep know? The sheep know this is the most fertile land to graze, so that's where they went naturally, that was where they went. But, but Shuaib told him, don't take them there, don't go there, don't even look at the place. His job, Musa's job, was to say, get them, that's what this part of this thing is from, grab them around the neck, and don't let them to go there, because that's not good for him, but he let them to go. And then he went to sleep. Foolish boy. The snake comes. And the snake is about to go into the sheep. This is a big snake. And you'll see snakes in this story, big, big snakes. The stick of Musa, the staff of Musa, becomes a snake. As soon as that snake comes, the stick of Musa changes. It becomes a snake, another snake, a huge snake, and eats the other snake. And immediately, then the staff comes back to being just a stick again. Right? Musa wakes up and he sees next to him where he was lying with his stick like this, sleeping, all the blood and bones from this snake lying on the ground. So this is when he begins to understand something is really going on here. He is bewildered, he's surprised, and in the evening when he goes back with the sheep, he tells Nebi Shweib the whole story. And Nebi Shweib is very happy about this. And he says to Musa, La, ya Musa, let me tell you this. This year, all the rams that are born to this flock, they'll all be for you. Every ram will be for you. Okay? And next year, all the females will be for you. And all the rams will be mine. And then uh, all the sheep with two colors of wool will be yours. And then, and then all this. Musa becomes a rich man. That year, all of the sheep are rams. The next year, they're all females. Shwa, of course, knows this, right? So he suddenly, as remember, remember the story, as we told it in the story of, of Sidna, uh, Sidna Ibrahim, when he was in Egypt land, that when he came back from Egypt land with his cousin Lot, they had to decide to live in different parts of, of, the, of the Holy Land because they had such big flocks. He became very wealthy. Because a man's wealth is by his animals. And he has all these animals. He, became, he becomes very, and the best wool, and the best everything. And all of this, all of this, this is this thing from Schweib. Because what does Schweib need? Nothing. He's got everything he needs. Simple man, simple house, simple life. Two daughters, the one gone already, right, like that. You know, and, and the son, you know, becomes suddenly, you know, like, Lots of sheep, lots of thing, you know, uh, taking sheep, taking sheep. You know, he's in a good state. But time is passing now, 
And what happens? How long passes? 18 years he stands with the sheikh. Not 10 years like he said he was going to. 18 years he stays with the sheikh, learning, learning. He's, because this is a relationship like of a father, a spiritual father and his son. Because his father was the guy who went and told the carpenter, you know. I mean, his father was not, you know, not exactly on the ball, you know, Musa's father, alayhi salam. You know, he told, he's the one who told the carpenter, you know, like uh, the carpenter goes and tells Firon and blah, blah, blah. So, but, but, but Shwaib, you know, takes him like his son and because he's with his daughter. And, you know, like, I mean, they are just, you know, this is the thing. But what happens? He misses his mom. Everybody. And not only he has one mom, he has two moms. He has Barka, his mom, and his the woman who nursed him. And Asiya, alayhi salam, huh? Firaun's wife, who has taken care of him all those years. is like a mom. He has two moms. And what else does he have? A brother, Harun, who he loves dearly. And Harun, he didn't burn his mouth. He didn't burn his hands. Harun is like the guy who goes to Yale or to Harvard, and he's like first in the class and everything. Harun is a mouth. Harun is a, a speaker. Harun is like highly intelligent. Harun is highly and very sweet man. Very, very sweet man. He misses his brother. He only knew, like he knew him, like his brother's a year or two older than him, but that's his big brother. He misses his big brother. He wants to go see his big brother. And he wants to go see who? Mariam, his sister. Mariam who followed his path through the river and saw him and brought his mother to all of that. And he loves Mariam. He loves these people. This is his family. He wants to go to see his family. So he tells Schwab, Schwab, look at me, you know, I mean, I got I to gotta go home and see mom, you know, because like a long time has passed. I haven't seen my moms. I haven't seen my sister. And Schwab says, Fadl, Bismillah, you've given me 18 years. You're ready. There's a big, big thing that's going on here. Not a, not a small thing that's going on here because the student is leaving his teacher. The student is leaving his teacher. My teacher made me teach five years under his eye. Five years I teach under his eye. Meaning, I do this, you see what I'm doing? I do this, he's there. He's listening to what I'm doing. He comes once a month to see what am I doing. Okay, he tells me what I'm doing wrong, what I'm doing right, how to do it, how to do it better. That's after seven years just studying. Seven, five, twelve years. As I was my, and I should have been another bunch of years, but I wound up coming back to America before I should have. But it would have been better if I hadn't, but in some ways, but maybe but this is in accord with a dream that Sheikh Mohammed got, so I had to come, so I couldn't do anything about it in any way. But like that's how it works. If your teacher sees that you can teach, right, then he tells you, son, teach, right? But he watch you to instruct you, right? Like that. Eighteen years, he spent eighteen years, he's working with him to grow grow him up to be capable of doing the job. Hmm? That's where we say, this hand is in the hand of a man, who's in the hand of a man. This is, this go that way, that's how it works. We are from the school of Sidna Ali, alayhi salam. This is one long line of teachers who, behind me is a teacher, behind him is a teacher, behind him is a teacher, behind him is a teacher. Behind him is a teacher who watched over their students to make sure this is this school, this humble little school here. This is a thousand year old school, my friends. For a thousand years, we've been teaching in this particular way. There are people, other people teach Abdul Qadir Jalani's way, people te teach uh, other Shayyuk's way. But this way, we've had a thousand years of people teaching. Generation after generation, we've produced people. Generation after generation. That's how you can tell. Not something like one generation, like uh, Nayat Khan or something like that. Two generations or something. This is not the way. You need depth in the teaching. Depth. Long depth of teaching. You need a teacher behind you who has been a teacher, who is taught to be a teacher, who has been taught to be a teacher, who has been taught to be. This is Shwaib and Musa alayhi salam. This is how he comes. This is where he comes from. This is who he is. And he's still not a Nabi yet. He's just the student, humble student of Sidna Shwaib. That's how he thinks. I'm going to go home and see mom. Moms. Got two moms. I'm going to go see my moms. 
So he takes his daughter, who's pregnant, his wife, who's pregnant, huh? Sabura. He takes her, and off they go. So, yeah, and Shuaib is very happy about it. He says, go, "Go ahead, no problem. Everything is good." And like that, so he leaves with all kissy kissy and love, 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 and everything like that. And they went three days, and they were three days out from Egypt, and there was a huge. They were in the Jebel in Sinai, somewhere near Jebel uh, Sinai, and there's this huge storm that comes late in the afternoon and, and the night comes suddenly and there are flashes of lightning everywhere and, and it begins to rain and hailstones begin to fall and his wife is pregnant and expecting and, and you know she, 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 now she's going into what do you call it she's beginning to go into contractions and labor and you know and all this is happening what am I going to do you know he's in the middle of nowhere he doesn't know where he's going there's a storm and everything like that he tries to find a place he finds a cave in a mountain in the side of the mountain. He takes his wife, she's yeah, baby. Take her, put it in the cave, and he's sitting and said, What am I gonna do? You know, and she it's not like you can go down the street, there's a hospital over there, there's nothing like that. He's along with his baby, he's never delivered a baby. What's he going to do? Well he's they, looking out the thing, he sees a light, sees a fire, sees something burning, something going on. What's going on? What's going on? He says. So he tell his wife, he says, look, you stay here, lie down, be quiet, don't do anything. I see this light over there. I'm going to go see. Maybe, remember I told you in the beginning when I told you the thing, it all starts from this story. When Musa completed his term of service, I read you this ayah, he was traveling with his family in the desert, and he saw a fire from the direction of the mountain. And he said to his family, meaning to his wife, wait here, I see a fire far away. Maybe I can bring you some news about which way to go, because they don't know which way to go, now they're lost, or I can at least get some fire to make a fire to keep you warm, okay? So this is what's happening. So he goes, leave his wife in the cave, she's like, oh, oh, like, tell you to do something, honey, please, you know, I mean, you know, this is the whole situation, if you've had babies, wives, and husbands here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is what's going on. He's left his wife there. He sees this fire. He's going to this fire. He's walking. He's like, he's walking the fires further away. He keeps walking the fires further away, further away, further away. He says. Then he hears this voice. He says, "Inni ana rabuku fakla naalek, inna kabilwali mukadasi tua." Truly, I am your Lord. The voice says to him, "Ya Musa, I am your Lord." I am the one who created you. I am the one who sustained you. I am the one who's done everything for you. This is who I am. I'm talking to you, Musa. Take off your shoes. Take off your sandals. You are in the holy valley of Tua. The twice holy valley of Tua. Then he says to him, I have chosen you. An aktartuka fa stemi lima yuha. I have chosen you. Listen to me, what I am going to reveal to you. I am Allah. I am Allah, he tells him. There is no other deity but me, no one else. Worship me. Establish the salat that you might remember me. And establish the worship. The hour is coming, but I have concealed it. So that every self can be repaid for its efforts. You don't know that the end of the world is upon you. I don't know that the end of the world is upon you. Why? So uh, do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. La ikraha fideen. There's no coercion in religion. You want to pray, pray. You don't want to pray, don't pray. You want to fast, fast. Don't fast, don't. Whatever you want to do. There's nobody with a stick on your head. You're free. But why are you free? So I can see what you will do when I give you your freedom. I have told you my orders. I have revealed to you my orders. But you're free to do whatever you want to do. So I can tell who listens to me and who doesn't listen to me. That's what he says. I am Allah. The hour is coming, but I have concealed it so that every self will be repaid for its effort. Do not let those who have no iman and follow their own whims and desires keep you from this way, or you will be destroyed. And then the voice says to Musa, What's that in your hand, Ya Musa? What's that in your hand, Ya Musa? And he says, 
Musa says, this is my stick. I lean on it. And I break the leaves from the trees for my animals. And I grab them around the neck. There I have other uses for this stick too, but you know, like that. The voice says to him, throw it, Musa. Throw your stick. He throws the stick. And the stick, bah, becomes this great snake. And it's like, like this, like that in front of him. And then he's overwhelmed with it. My stick has become a snake. He's like all this thing. And he turns around because he doesn't know. He just heard this voice. There's this light in the desert in the middle of the night. His wife is back in the cave like this. People talking to him, telling him they're Allah, telling him to do this thing. Where's your stick? Here's my stick. Here's my stick. Turns to a snake. You know, he's going to run away from this craziness, whatever this is. And Allah says to him, Khudha, grab it. Wala takhaf. Don't fear. I will return it to its original form. And as soon as he grabs the stick, it turns into, he grabs the snake, you know, he puts out his hand, he grabs that snake, it turns back into a stick again, like that. Then Allah tells him, take your hand, remember the hand that had burned, the hand that he put into the thing, the hand that had been burned, he says, take your hand and put it in your cloak under your arm, and then take it out. And he takes out his hand, and his hand is glowing with light. And all that scar tissue and everything like that that he had burned himself with is gone. He's completely healed. And his hand is like that, like this. Remember here, the hand of Musa, how badly burned it had been, and now returned to its condition. And Allah tells him now, he, he tells him his orders. Go to Firaun, invite him to Iman. Invite him to become a Muslim. Invite him to surrender to Firaun. Because you know him, because I put you to live in his house. I learned you everything so that you, you know him like your father, because he's like a father to Musa, isn't he? You know him better than anybody knows him. You know his laws, you know everything about him. I want you to go to him, and I want you to make him to be a Muslim. I want you to say, La ilaha illallah. I want you to get him the head of all of Egypt, the owner of all the people, the, the slave master of Beni Israel. I want you to get him to the point where he says, La ilaha illallah. That's what I want you to do. He says, I can't figure out how he's going to do it. He says to Allah, Rabbi Israh li sadri. Oh Allah, open up my heart. Amri, make things easy for me. Because he told him his hand but not his mouth. He says, untie the knots from my tongue so that people can understand me. I fear, he says, my Lord, I fear that they will deny me. I fear that my heart will be constricted inside of me. My tongue will not be free. Please send me my brother Harun to help me. Because he knows Harun is a fantastic speaker. And everything. Send me Harun to help me. He asked Allah. This is, this is his situation. What Allah tell him then? He says, go. Go and do it. Musa returns to the mountain and he goes to the valley where in that cave where he left his wife, she had given birth. There's a baby. When he gets into the cave, he sees all these strange women inside the cave. These are the Huriya, the women of the garden. And they had come to deliver the baby for him. Baby is very happy, everything's fine. Beautiful. MashaAllah. He tells his wife, Ya Sabura, what happened? Allah made me to be a Nabi. What can I do? He called me to go to Firaun. He says, I now assign you, it's to his wife, he says to her, I assign you to the care of Allah. But for safety for you and the new baby, I shall proceed alone to the city to deliver the message to Firaun. Because he knows that when he goes to deliver this message to Firaun, what he's going to face. I, I, I leave you, don't worry about anything. She says, O Musa, do what Allah has ordered you to do. It is of the utmost importance. Make haste towards your destiny. This is what you want in a wife, man. After all, she was the daughter of Nabi Shuaib. She was the daughter of a prophet. She told him, don't worry about me, Musa. She just had a baby in a cave in the middle of nowhere. She says, go. 
And soon after that, the next morning, when he was getting ready to go to Egypt, there was a caravan that came. It was returning from Egypt to Median that happened to pass by the spot where his wife was, and they took her and delivered her to her father, Nebi Shuaib, in Median. That's how that happened. Now Musa went on his journey, and he reached Egypt late at night. He went straight to his mother's house, and he knocked on the door, and now his very aged mother, because 18 years had passed, said, Who is it? He says, I'm a traveler. His aged mother opened the door and welcomed him in, and not really realizing who he was. It was dark, it was night. She immediately made preparations for a meal for the traveler. He says, That's who she is. And when he's busy eating, his brother Harun comes in. And seeing Musa, he says, Mom, Who's that guy? And she says, Some poor wayfarer. He says, Our guest tonight. Harun comes in and he says, Welcome. Brother, this is your own house. Eat and relax and rest. That's the kind of people they were. Yani, come on, eat. That's all there. Harun looking at this guy, and he's looking at this guy. You know, he says, "What's going on here? Something, something is drawing him to this traveler." And he says, "But, he, but he's quiet." And after a few moments, Musa says to him, he "says What are you looking at me so intently for?" He says, "I'm your brother, Musa." Oh, Musa! Whoa, whoa! And everything was go crazy. Mariam, who was sleeping in the back room, she's come out of, oh, yeah, my brother, wow, there, everybody's there, brother, mother, sister, everybody's crying, and then and that's all, and then said like that, and when he tells them the whole thing, and everything like that, and it's like an Eid. Everybody's like super happy. That's what happened. But then he tells, he says, yeah, Harun, I got to, I got to explain something to you, my brother. You're not on your own time anymore. <laughs> no more. Finished. You have, Nabua has been put on me and it's been put on you. And you have to take this thing here that Allah gave you and you have to help guide the people to the path of righteousness. This is your job. This is your job. And we have to, the first person that we have to talk to is Obama. I mean, uh, Firon. Or uh, Putin or whoever. First, first guy we're going to go see, that's who we're going to go see. We're going to go to the White House tonight. And we're going to say, Obama, yeah, I know your name is Hussein. Now's the time. Can't, got to stop kidding around. No more of this kidding around stuff. This, you know, prophet, these guys, this is you are Hussein. La ilaha illallah, right? You know, this is what this is the truth of the matter. No more time to play around. Okay. Oh, whoa. So like the Harun was fearful because <laughs> he had grown up in the same house, and he grown and he was a very, as like I said, he was a highly accomplished public speaker and very deeply learned man indeed. And he told Musa, he says, "Listen, brother, in the time that you've been gone, Firaun has increased his." His depotism, his oppression, like the, I was listening, I think it was the mayor of, or the uh, governor of New Jersey, and he's saying, you know, slavery was abolished in America in 1861. But he says, I've been thinking, 16% of the people of my state are black, but 67% of the people in the prisons are black. So slavery was not abolished in America. Don't ever think that it was abolished in America. It's gotten worse. They've traded one set of chains for another set of chains. See, he said that on television. And that's what Harun tells. He said, Musa, no matter how bad it was when you were here, it's worse now. When they told us that they were going to have things flying in the sky over this, the land of America that could shoot an American citizen down from the sky without a trial, without anything like that. You know where we've come to? I grew up in this country. I can't even believe it. I can't believe where I live. They're going to kill us from the sky? That's what they've told us. I said, no, no, only if he's an enemy combatant. Mm. Am I an enemy combatant? I wonder sometimes, you know. Hmm? This is the situation. So you see when he tell him, look, things have gotten worse here. Then it got better. I remember Eisenhower. I remember Harry Truman. I remember these people. 
They didn't know have the things flying around the sky. The idea of shooting somebody from the sky who's an American citizen, or even in Yemen shooting an American citizen without due process, something called due process. It's something in, in, the, in the Bill of Rights. It's something that America, every American is entitled to. Due process. Due process. If you're guilty, go to the court of the law. Stand before your people. And they will judge you. Are you right? Or are you wrong? And the jury will deliver the, the, the judgment. That's what we were promised. But now something can fly in the sky. They consider that you're one of those people. It can shoot you, kill you. They say, oh, well, Aulaki, he was like that. But what about Aulaki's son, 18 years old, born in, in uh, where? New Mexico. American citizen. All right, so you see what time. So Harun tell him, Musa, things are bad here. Not like the way it used to be. It's worse than it used to be. Remember, this is the guy who killed 90,000 people, 90,000 Jews. He killed them, 90,000 members of Benin Israel, just because he was afraid that they might get him. Hmm? So he tells them that. The grim portrayal of Firaun's oppression by Harun made Musa more fearful than he was after, in, in the beginning. Because I said before, Pharaoh is not only the owner of all of the lands, he's not only the high priest, but he's also a god. And there's nobody who has anything that they can say to him. At least here we can still say something. Yet there's nothing to say to him. He is God. The president is God. Nothing you can say to him. He says, you, you're dead. That's it. You're going to make a protest? You make a protest? You're dead. That's the way the situation had come to. Now Harun, as I said, was a gifted speaker, and he was very responsible because all the time he was teaching the Israelites the way of worship as it was laid out and what he understood. And, and, he and Musa was afraid because he can't talk well. That's why he had asked for Harun. So now they're off and they're going to go together. To do, do they have they talked long enough now? Ten minutes ago, great. All right, so he says, Allah says to him, Are you, you, you with it? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. It's a good story? It's just a story. <laughs> right? This is not, I'm not telling you the bottom. I'm only telling you the dollar. But sometime maybe I tell you the bottom of all. Only a little bit of the bottom. Anyway, so he, Allah says to him, We'll strengthen your arm. Ya Musa, we're going to strengthen your arm with Harun. And of our signs, we give you both authority, and nobody's going to be able to put a hand on you. Nobody's going to touch you. You and those with you are going to be victors. Allah promises them that. He says, you are going to be victors. Don't fear. Fear not. La taqafish. Have no fear. You will be the victors. As Allah says, you know, have the deen al-haq. This is the way of truth, and it will come over every other way in the world. We know this as Muslims. Everybody will say, La ilaha illallah. Everybody's head will bow before Allah sooner or later. That's the truth. Here or there, it doesn't matter. Everybody's head will bow before Allah. Because when you see Allah, when you come to know Allah, you have no choice anymore. Here you have a choice. But when you see the power of Allah, and you know who is Allah, then you will bow. Because you'll have no choice then. Here you have the choice. Allah has time with you now. So we gave to Musa and Harun the Furqan, the, the thing to know what is right and what is wrong. We gave them light, and we gave them dhikr for those who are aware. And I want, I hope, in the second part, sometime to tell to a story about Harun and the golden calf. Different things are misunderstood about the story of Samiri and all that. But that's another story. Anyway, we're going to come to that. Also about, you know, when the Prophet was speaking of the beauty of Yusuf, he compares him to Harun. Harun was a very handsome man. Extremely handsome man. And Muhammad Wasallam mentions him also in the likeness to Ali Wasallam where the Prophet left to look for his family at the beginning of the Hijra. The hypocrites at the time began to spread the rumor that, that the Prophet found Ali a burden and he left him in Mecca to be, get, get rid of his presence. But Ali grieved when he heard this. And what Muhammad told the people is what he said. In the reply he says, they lie. I ask you to remain for the sake of it, because he left his brother. 
I ask you to remain for the sake of what I had left behind me. So return, represent me in my family and in yours. Are you not content, O Ali, that you should be unto me as Harun was to Musa? Hmm? Save that after me, there's no prophet. This is an Ibn Ishaq. So to continue, when the two were overwhelmed by fear, they entered the court of Firaun, the angel Jibreel came. And after conveying peace from Allah, he gave the revelation, Go, both of you, do not fear. I am with you, I hear, I see. Go forth. Truly, you are messengers of your Lord. Go to Beni, and he, he, then he go to Firaun, and he said to Firaun, We have come to you from Allah. Give us Beni Israel and stop torturing them. We have come with a sign from your Creator, and peace be upon those who follow the guidance. And immediately on hearing this wahi, Musa and Harun stood up and they go, no fear and everything like that. And here they go in front of him. And so what happens? This is the end of the, this part of the story. And he tells, Pharaoh says to him, what are you doing back here? Why are you like this? And then you killed my guard and you did all this? And he says, I, and Musa says, yeah, Pharaoh, because he knows him like a father. I was aware that your guard would, not, and I didn't think he would die from a blow from my fist. It, it was accidental. Allah has forgiven me. I left here fearing your anger at me. I lived in Medyan. Allah bestowed bounties on me beyond counting a wife, a child, sheep. I'm on my way back. And on my way back, I came through the valley of Tua, and he made me a Nebi. And this is the story. The Firaun said, well, what is this Nebi business, Ya Musa? And he says, listen, Firaun, it's Allah who has created you, both you and I and everything, and is he who sends in all things to their being and to their ends. Pharaoh mocked him and he says, what if I accept your rub? What will he give me? Pharaoh has everything, what can he give him? Huh? He said he'll give you three things, Pharaoh. He'll give you perpetual youth. He will give you sovereignty, not only over Egypt, but over the entire world. And he will increase your lifespan by another hundred years. Okay? You accept Islam? This is what Islam will give you. He asked him, well, what are we going to get out of this? He said, this is what you're going to get out of it. Okay? Well, these awards that were promised by Nebi Musa, you can understand, were very attractive and tempting. And Pharaoh became restless with this thing. And he called all of his ministers, and he said, especially the desire for perpetual youth, you know, all guys like that, they'd all like to be, you know, like 24, 25, 26, you know, like that, you know, 28 maybe, you know, you know, and then you get to be 50, you think, well, gee, if I was 40, you know, you get to be 60, if I was 50, you get to be 70, when you're in your 70s, you think, God, look at those guys, 60 years old, you know, and they really got it. <laughs> that's the way guys are, you know, anyway, so. This is the story. So, you know, that's what really got him. He said, whoa, I could be like, you know, like that forever, you know, whoa. Anyway, yeah. he, I'm going to stop. He says, uh, let me consult with my advisors about this. And then he called them all together. And uh, Haman, who was his chief minister, he says, Musa, you know what he's done in these 18 years? He's become a magician. And he's a liar. And don't fall prey to the promises of Musa. And Haman convinced Pharaoh to reject this offer. All these three things he offered them. Next day when Marusa, Musa and Harun came back, and this is the end of it, Pharaoh says, okay, show me a proof that you're a Nebi. And what basis should I believe that you've been appointed by the Creator as a Nebi? You know, you were a kid growing up in my house. Now you're a Nebi? As Pharaoh was speaking, Nebi... Musa took his staff and he threw it. Just threw it. Like that. The snake came. This snake was when its mouth was open, its lower jaw was on the ground and its upper jaw was on the ceiling. This is the size of the snake. And this is not a little room like this. This is the throne room of Pharaoh. You know, three stories high. This is the mouth of the snake. And Harun is sitting up there like this. So he's this mouth like this, you know, teeth that are like 20 feet long and things like this, you know. And he says, 
and the scene was set for the snake to swallow Firaun, mm. to swallow his throne, to swallow the entire palace. Everybody freaked out. There was pandemonium in the palace. Everybody's running and screaming. Firaun himself comes down from his throne. He's looking for some way to get out. Describing the scene, Rasulullah said, several hundred of his men were killed in the ensuing mad stampede. Everybody was madly dashing to escape the serpent. If Iran was running, he said, Ya Musa, Ya Musa, by that one God who has appointed you to be the messenger, I implore you, save us from this destruction. I believe you. I am going to release Bani Israel. They're all free to go with you. Immediately taking pity on Firaun, who had, after all, raised him and educated him and given him a life of ease, Nebi Musa put his hand on the head of the snake, and there it was back again. It was just a stick. Everybody was shuddering. Everybody was dumbstruck. Everybody was in confusion. Quran went back up on his throne. He took his position, and he said, affectionately now almost, Ya Musa, you have demonstrated the most frightful thing. Now show me something beautiful at which Nebi Musa inserted his hand back again into his garment, and he pulled out his hand, that Rowan remembered as being burnt, and he put his hand up like that, and it was beautiful, and it was shining with light, and he saw this hand, with the light shining from it. Whoa. Profoundly impressed by these two miracles, the of Nebi Musa, Rowan said to his ministers, now, guys, is there any way that I should not refuse accepting this message and accepting this deen and, and the, all the court of the of Faroon was silenced. I stopped the story now. I, we'll go on. I tell it on the television and you can tune in. <laughs> part two and part three and part four inshallah. <laughs> anyway, this is somewhat of the story of Sidna Musa. So you know you many things you have learned. Yes? You learned about his wife you learned about the cave. You didn't know. Did you know these things before? No. Did you know really about his stick? No. Men, did you know who Schweib was? No. Some do, some don't. So that's why we have these things. That's why we have these Sunday meetings. Education. This, you, your idea of Musa is changed. When you hear the word Musa now, you have a different picture than you did two hours ago. I promise you. Right or wrong? Yes. Right. So, inshallah, but listen to what he's talking about. Understand what he's talking about. And, and inshallah, we go, because what happens beyond this is like really, uh, you know, really, really something. So that's it in the Musa, alayhi salam, wa Allahu alam, wa al-fatiha, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, al-Maliki, al-Mateen. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in, ahdina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Adina, namta alayhim, wa ilim, wa dhubi alayhim, wa na'adu alayhim. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. Thank you.